uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 under the title of dealing with false teachers or dealing with false teaching. There's so much in this letter of 1 Timothy. In fact, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus collectively are known as the pastoral epistles. They are known as the pastoral epistles. So Paul writes to Timothy, who was in Ephesus, the pastor in Ephesus, and he writes to Titus, who was pastoring in uh, Crete. And just to give you a, a brief outline of 1 Timothy in the, in the whole of the book, uh, we basically have in this book, we have uh, the, the, the issue of teaching, and as we said, false teachers and dealing with them in chapter 1. Then in chapter 2, we have the subject of the worship of the church, the right worship of the church uh, put into place. Then in chapter 3, we have the officers of the church, elders and deacons, their qualifications and calling and so on. And then in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, we have uh, the minister or the pastor of the church. And then in chapter 5, we have the church's inward life, how we deal with each other. And then in chapter 6, we have the church in the world, how we live in the world. So it's such a comprehensive, there's much in 1 Timothy. So it exhorts you even in the week ahead, be reading over uh, this uh, epistle, this letter of 1 Timothy. Of course, it's written to um, uh, a young church, a young pastor who's told to let no man despise thy youth. Obviously, there were people despising Timothy, and but he was to realize his calling and he was to preach the word of God, teach the word of God, have the, the right worship of God, the right officers of the church, um, and to have a good relationship within the church and also with the world. So, so much in this letter. But we're going to deal with chapter 1 uh, this morning. And the first thing that we notice is Paul's authority to deal with this to deal with this subject of dealing with false teachers. His authority is grounded and derived from the following four facts. First of all, his particular calling and sending as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He begins with these words, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was supernaturally sent by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In fact, his calling, his, his meeting with Christ is mentioned in three chapters in the book of Acts. Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. A sort of a rare kind of triple emphasis in scripture. Three chapters are Parts of three chapters are given to this call of the Apostle Paul to his specific role and ministry within the church. Of course, the Apostles in general in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 uh, become the foundation. And Paul himself now becomes part of that foundation of the church. The Lord Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. We were watching a documentary uh, uh, recently and um, the one who was uh, the narrator for the documentary is, is they were in Jerusalem and they were brought down uh, under the ground and they're brought down below the, the walls um, of, uh, in, in Jerusalem and they're brought right down and, he, and he's, at one point they point to this uh, stone which is the, the keystone, which is the, uh, the cornerstone. And as the narrator was told that, that this is the sort of the rock bed stone, this is the, the main stone that all else is joined to, I thought of the Lord Jesus Christ. And indeed, Paul is speaking as an apostle, a sent one, 
Apostolos means simply sent. He is sent by Christ to preach the gospel and to bring the truth of God's word to the world and specifically to God's people to borrow the idea of of Acts chapter 18 where the Lord says, I have much people in this city. But also this authority was by the direct command of God himself. And we see that in the the words, by the commandment of God our Savior. And that's why Paul says in another place, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel, because God commanded him. And it's by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. This wasn't an option for Paul. He wasn't waiting for man's approval. And indeed, anyone that is truly called of God is not changed by the opinion of men. Because we have the commandment of God. It is God who calls us. It is God who fits us for his service. Also, Paul's authority was also seen in the power of his ministry in seeing many come to faith in his preaching. It is unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. He had begotten him again. As he says in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 4.15, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Spurgeon speaks of the time when he experienced his first uh, true convert. And he felt it as a, as a kind of seal to his ministry. Now, many ministers live their whole life and never see one convert. So it's not a a ban to the ministry, but it's it's certainly a seal to the ministry. It's certainly a, a reinforcement of the ministry when some are saved under our preaching. I remember one minister in Scotland mourning the fact that He'd seen a number of people converted in the early days of his ministry, but then in later years saw no conversions. So we have to be careful when we're interpreting uh, these uh, facts. But here Paul refers to his uh, bringing Timothy to the faith as a seal of his ministry. Also, he writes this letter not from himself alone, but he writes it from God and Christ. It is grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. We could not write a letter in that way. Some do, um, wrongfully. Paul's writing as an inspired apostle. He's writing as one who can literally say he is writing from God. So back in those days, you began a letter in this way. You might write it uh, from Colin and from Dave and from Zuriel. You're writing a collective letter. Here Paul is writing a letter and he's saying it's not only from him, but it's from God. It is from Jesus Christ. This is the authority that he professed. So that forms the, sort of the basis for the whole letter. But then secondly, in this chapter 1, he deals with the stopping or the shutting of the mouths of false teachers and their teaching. This is a big part of the ministry, to to shut the mouths of false teachers. Note the the need of personal engagement in this important work in verse 3. Paul says, as I besought thee, Timothy, as I besought you to abide at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Essential part of the ministry, isn't it? To stop false teaching. Of course, Paul knew only too well the dangers at Ephesus because when, when he speaks, and again, 
Timothy, uh, just to remind you again, Timothy is a pastor in the church at Ephesus. And when Paul in chapter 20, Acts Acts 20, is speaking to the Ephesian elders, he says this in verse 28 of Acts 20. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purposed, purchased with his own blood. For I know this, this is the context, for I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves. Now notice here. Notice here. It says in verse 28. That the Holy Ghost had made you overseers. But even of them. Shall men arise. Speaking perverse things. To draw away disciples. After them. Therefore watch. Even in the context of elders. Elders. In Ephesus, speaking perversions. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. The danger of false doctrine. In fact, it goes, don't we were reminded in, in Revelation, that it gets to a point where they had forsaken their first love. They were good at works. They were good at deeds. They were good at doing things. But they had forsaken their first love. Then getting back to our main text. That which is to be avoided and why. Verse 4 of 1 Timothy 1. That which is to be avoided and why so. Neither give heed to fables. Endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. And look what Paul is saying here. And he uses the term fables or stories and endless genealogies. Things that produce questions among God's people in opposition or in contrast to godly edifying. In other words, one is to be rejected and one is to be promoted. Endless stories, endless questions, rather than godly edifying. Of course, the the enemy will seek to put questions into your heart, questions into your mind. Endless disputes, rather than godly edifying. That's the the call of the church, is to build each other up in our most holy faith. To spur each other on to to love and to good works. That's the calling of the church, isn't it? Isn't it? (laughs) That's our calling. Not not to tear down, not not to dispute, but to build up. That's That's the gospel, isn't it? That's what we're called to do. Not curiosities, but the comfort of the scriptures. And then the the purpose of God's command as it relates to to love. Notice verse 5. He talks about a a pure, unmixed love. And it's possible to have a sort of a, a mixed love. Mixed with other things. But he talks about charity out of a pure heart, a sincere heart, a clean heart, a clear heart. Talks about a good conscience. What's a good conscience? An effective conscience is one that works well. That when you're doing wrong, it tells you you're doing wrong. Tells you you're doing wrong. Not a conscience that is Seared with a hot iron. But a a working conscience. A lively conscience. And then there's a a sincere faith. Again, going back to to Ephesus. Paul could say to even some of those elders. Even of your own selves. 
It's a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge. That's why we read Ezekiel 34. The church has been wrecked by false shepherds, self serving shepherds. Not sincere. And we, we have to constantly guard our hearts, guard our minds, guard our, our motives in all of these things. But then, fourthly, on this second point, the false teachers are turned away from these central principles and we're in real danger of turning others away from them also. A bad example. Is powerful, isn't it? From which some, having swerved, have turned aside onto vain jangling, vain talk, empty discussions, conversations that have no benefit. The devil knows what to do to destroy the church, doesn't he? Good examples are so beneficial. Such a blessing to each other. Pressing on. Just carrying on. Devoted to Christ. Devoted to the truth. Again in Revelation when Paul, or sorry, when the, the Lord Jesus Christ through John speaks to the churches. He says, even if one opens the door, I will come in. Uh, and the challenge there to each one of us is for us all to be that one that will open the door of the church. It's not time to open the door of your heart. <laughs> it's opening the door of the church. We are all responsible. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, we are all responsible to open, not that physical door, but to open the spiritual door, if you like, to the church, of the church, to the Lord Jesus Christ. John Bunyan wrote that little book, A Welcome to Jesus Christ. A Welcome to Jesus Christ. That's our calling. That's, we make it so complicated. And, and the devil likes to make things complicated, doesn't he? The devil likes to confuse us. The devil likes to throw in the questions. To have us, we don't know where we are. God knows in the day that you eat this, it's going to be much better for you. The devil loves to minister questions into your mind. Put doubts in your mind. That's the work of the enemy. The, the calling of Christ is to put the enemy behind, put the the, the doubts behind, the questions behind, the, the empty and endless talking behind, and press on towards the goal, the high calling of God. That's the challenge. That's the call. Notice also on the second point, what they desire, what these false teachers desire, what they want is to be teachers of the law, but then Paul says they don't even understand what they're saying. They don't understand what they affirm. They are robotic, empty vessels, just parroting words. There's nothing going on that's real in here, in their minds. They don't comprehend what they're saying. They are just like those, you know, AI machines. You know, you hear them on the, the computers. And they sound human. But there's no understanding. It's just a, a parroting of words. It's just a, a making of sound. No inward reality. The challenge for us as the people of God is to... Uh, in the fear of God, come before the Lord and want that inward reality so that we are not robotic, empty vessels, clanging symbols, just saying words, but not really understanding what we are saying. 
But then thirdly, we have the right use of the law in verses 8 to 11. And this, again, I hadn't planned this to be at the same time as our our catechism uh, questions, but again, in the providence of God, it fits so well. The The first point is this, and this third point is, the law is good and is to be used. It says in verse 8, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. And here's the point. The law of God is still to be used. Now, if it's been abrogated, as many even within, you know, even some very well-known preachers say that the Ten Commandments has been abrogated. Well, Well, no, because it says here in the Word of God that we are to use the law of God lawfully. Well, if it's abrogated, if it's been done away with, If the law of God has been put away, well, then we cannot use it. It has a use. And we see this, don't we, in, I think we read last week, was it, or the week before, we read from Matthew chapter 5, the Lord Jesus Christ using the law. I'm I'm reading at the moment from um, Gresham Machen on his little book, Christianity and liberalism. And he talks about the liberals wanting the the Sermon on the Mount to be sort of like the golden rule of the Christian life. And Gresham Machen says that liberals are so mistaken because the, the Sermon on the Mount is not written to the world. It's written to the disciples of Christ. Why? Because only we have the law of God in our hearts. If you go to the Sermon on the Mount, to Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and try and apply those principles uh, as a, a means of salvation, you're condemning yourself. Because it's not the law you need, it is salvation. So what is the right use of the law? There's Three uses um, mentioned. And the first use is to convict. To convict. Look at verses 9 and 10. Knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners. In other words, it's to show them their sin. For unholy, profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. And it goes on and on down to the end of verse 10. The law is designed to condemn and to silence, not to give hope. The Sermon on the Mount is not to give hope to people that they can be righteous in themselves. But to leave the person realizing they have no hope. Because... Not only does the law of God tell us not to sin outwardly, it says not to sin inwardly. Not even to have wicked desires, sinful desires. Romans 3 verse 19 says, We know that whatever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, That every mouth may be stopped. And again, the law is not abrogated because its first use is to stop every mouth and to hold the world guilty or accountable before God. See, the law is not abrogated. The law is still in force. Can't have it both ways. So the the well-known preachers who will tell us today that the law has been done away with for a better law are are wrong. The second use of the law is to convert. The law is not contrary to the gospel, but it's part of the gospel. Man needs to know his law's condition before he will ever desire a savior. You know, you go go to people on the, the street and you say, Jesus loves you. It means nothing to them. In fact, it's the worst thing you can say to them. Because it, it, just, it, it, it just promotes the, the complacency. 
And most of them need to be told that God hates them. That God despises them and God is just waiting to, to bring them to hell. That's what they, they need to understand. That they need the fear of God. They need the dread of God. That's part of the gospel. That is, is part of the word of God that needs to be preached. So it's not, it's not good enough just to go and tell people. In fact, it's a misrepresentation of the gospel just to go and tell people God loves you. Not only is it not good for them, it's not even true. Because, and in case you think I'm wrong, the law is not part of the gospel, or, you know, I'm wrong in saying it's part of the gospel. Look at verse 11, says, according to the glorious gospel. In other words, everything he's just said in the previous verses is according to the gospel. In other words, it's one and the same message. It's all part of the same message. And that's why, going back to Romans, Paul says in Romans, um, he spends the first three chapters up to uh, verse 20, or verse 21, is it, uh, of chapter 3, outlining the sin of Jew and Gentile. I'm assuming that's not because he didn't like the message, but... Uh, <laughs> So he spends the first three chapters dealing with man's sin before he gets in in chapter 3 verse 21 of Romans to a, a, a righteousness from God. He puts it this way in Galatians 3 verses 24 and 25. Therefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We need the schoolmaster, don't we? We need the law. Some of us remember, I'm probably one of the last generations to remember calling our teachers master. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> and you just, it was, that's what you call them, they were your master. And of course, that wouldn't be politically correct today, would it? <laughs> calling a teacher master. But the law was our school master. To bring us to Christ. And you know, even as believers, we need to be constantly brought back to Christ, don't we? We need to be constantly brought back to Him. That we might be justified by faith, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. No longer for justification. But we're still responsible to and convicted by the law when we sin. It's still part of our being brought closer to Christ in our sanctification. And that leads us to the third use, to conduct, to conduct us. So it, it convicts of sin, it converts us to Christ, and then it conducts us in the Christian life. The three uses of the law. And there's so many who have forsaken those three uses of the law. The law has been done away with. The law has been despised. It's ceased to be used, even by famous preachers. Fourthly, in verses 12 to 17, the right or the only enabling for the ministry. The principle is this, only those who are enabled by the Lord can deal with the false teachers and their false doctrine. And, and here's the deliberation. It's not, it's not for every Christian to find out every problem in the church. It's really important to understand this. It is not the responsibility of every Christian to find out every problem in the church. Your calling as a member of the church, as an adherent of the church, is to follow Christ. Keep following him. Paul here presents himself as the example, the, bl the blueprint, if you like. Notice there's an acceptance, accounting faithful, not 
that we are, but that we are considered faithful. Verse 12 says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful. Of course he was not faithful in himself. He was a a persecutor of the church. But he counted him and when Christ counts us faithful, that's our enabling for the ministry. It's not that we are able in ourselves. It's not that we have personal qualities in ourselves that make us acceptable. The word counted here means considered. Also on this point, the above must be the right understanding as Paul was not faithful when called. In fact, he was the exact opposite. Verse 13 says he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now the because here is not an absolute, otherwise ignorance becomes a grounds of salvation. John Gill says his ignorance and unbelief were not a reason or cause of his obtaining mercy, which is always shown in a sovereign way, but a reason showing that that was mercy that was vouchsafed to him since It was mercy that was vouchsafed to him since he was such an ignorant and unbelieving creature. It was all of mercy. Sovereign mercy. Also, only the grace and favor of Christ enables us for the ministry. It's not because I'm a good person. It's not because I'm a a faithful person in myself. It's the grace and favor of Christ that enables us for the ministry. And only those thus shown such favor can teach in Christ's school. We don't want the church led by self-righteous individuals filled with their own self-righteousness, depending on their own self-righteousness. We want men who have been broken by the knowledge of their own fallen sinfulness, of their own unfaithfulness, of their own inability, broken by Christ, shown their true nature because the Pharisees thought they were the the bee's knees, didn't they? The Pharisees were convinced that they were the role models. They were the best and, and they used that to put the people down and they are the very ones are kind of ones that Ezekiel 34 is written to deal with. Oppressing the people, putting the people down, damaging the flock of God, not understanding what they're saying, having no direct dealings with God himself, having no passion for the truth, no real love. They never loved the Sabbath. They used the Sabbath as a a tool to beat people down with. It was said of them they wouldn't even lift their finger to do one of these things themselves. And that's why he speaks of the grace of our Lord being exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So that the more aware we have of the, uh, the more aware we are of the abundant grace of Christ to our soul, the more fitted we are to be able ministers of the new covenant. And only those who know their state and the depth of their sin can be truly godly teachers in the school of Christ. It says in verse 15, this is a faithful saying. Now notice Paul does not speak here in the past tense. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom not I was the chief. Of whom I am the chief. I'm the chief sinner. I'm the worst man that I know. In my mind, everyone else in the church is better than me. That's the, that, that's the attitude. 
And I thank God I can genuinely say that I think I'm the worst sinner in this room at this moment. And if you cannot say that genuinely, I doubt your salvation. I doubt your salvation. If you think you're better than anybody else, I doubt your salvation gravely. Because what salvation teaches you is that you are the chief of sinners. You are the sinner. That's what the the publican uh, professed. It's God being, in the original Greek, it is God being merciful to me, the sinner, the only sinner. The Pharisees were very good at pointing the finger. But for the believer, we point inward. We say, I'm the sinner. I am wicked. I am sinful. And it's only somebody who can say that who's an able minister of the new co- that's what it, That's what enables. It's not your good life. It's not your success over sin. That doesn't make you an able minister of the new covenant. And we'll <laughs> deal with that in 1 Timothy 3 if we get to it. We're in danger in the church of producing self-righteous Pharisees rather than humbled ministers of the new covenant. Fifthly, Paul shows here that he is the prototype, not just for teachers and preachers, but for all believers to come. Verse 16, Howbeit for this cause or for this reason I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. And then there's that praise, a fitting note of praise. Now unto the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be all honor and glory for it. all the praise goes to our God no praise to man you see these false teachers they wanted the praise they wanted to lead disciples after themselves they wanted to put forward themselves but Paul's message of, of, of glorious gospel mercy brings all the praise alone to God not to self not to self we don't praise men. The Lord Jesus Christ said, if, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We, we lift him up. We praise him. We bless him. We worship Christ. And then we come back to the point of the chapter in verses 18 to 20. This solemn charge in the context of false teachers. This young man, this despised man by by many. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war, a good warfare. Do you see how it's described here? So in the last couple of weeks we've been seeing documentaries on D-Day the D-Day landings and I think the numbers are that as the boats landed I think a hundred thousand lost am I right I think it was a hundred thousand anyway it was it was a lot who lost their lives young men 90 and 20 21 years of age and for many of them it was, their, it was their first engagement. So they literally done all their training. They step off a boat and they're shot dead. And here we have a young man. Here we have a young man. And he's called to a good warfare. And a warfare where he'll deal with false teaching. There will be engagement. There will be wounds. There will be danger and and that's why many today choose not to engage 
Because they don't want the danger. They don't want the wounds. They don't want the hurt. They don't want the pain. And therefore they avoid the warfare. They opt for a much safer and therefore useless form of Christianity. Which is no Christianity at all. But Paul and Timothy would engage in this warfare. They would take the wounds. They would take the danger. The conduct is holding faith and a good conscience. See, it it doesn't matter what other people say about you, but it really does matter what goes on inside of you. That matters. Your relationship to God matters. Your relationship to your conscience matters. And you see, when, when, when that's your focus, and what, 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 what Paul is saying to Timothy here is, Timothy, don't worry about what they say, but do be concerned about you, inside of you. Hold faith. And a good conscience. Have the confidence that comes from God alone. Not from the approval of men. Not from the words of men. But from a saving relationship to your God. So not just dealing with the false teachers. But Timothy deal with yourself. Watch verse Uh, 2 Timothy 4 verse 5 says, Watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, Timothy. Get on with the work. That's what we're called to do, isn't it? Getting on with the work. Doing the work of the ministry. Not being sidetracked, not being deviated, not being confused, not being questioned in that bad sense. Not that questions are always wrong, but not having confusion set in. It goes on to say, and I think Michael quoted these words to me last week. Which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. And as we were saying last week. Michael, shipwreck, it's still still a ship. But it's wrecked. It's useless. You know, 1 Corinthians 3 tells us it's possible to be saved. But to be useless. And I know some people say, oh, that's just talking about ministers. No, no, I think that applies to everybody. I think there's an application to all Christians. It's possible to be a Christian and to be become useless to become ineffective it's, it, it's impossible to be saved as by fire but have nothing to show for it on the day of judgment and I don't know how all that works <laughs> I, I really don't but I know the scripture says it and, and that alone should send fear into my heart that it's possible to To know Christ, be saved by Christ, but have no product in this world to his praise. Gill says, persons may be shipwrecked and not lost. There is a feigned and counterfeit faith which may be in persons who have no true grace and may be shipwrecked so as to be lost, so it can apply to both. And then lastly, we have the correction. Paul is never slow to name names. Many times he speaks in the positive and in the negative of people. Which is a lesson in itself because God takes notice of us. Of whom is Hymenius, Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, the most severe form of church discipline, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And this is hard, isn't it? This is difficult. We're called to warfare. And there will 
be an effect. My own great-grandfather, when he returned back from the Great War, as, or the First World War, as some people call it, the effects of war. He literally drank himself into the grave at the age of 29. 29 years of age because of the effects of war. Warfare is painful. And may God help us to wage that warfare with God as our refuge, with God as our strength. Amen. Let us sing of the glorious Good Shepherd in Psalm 23. Psalm 23. And we'll sing the, the whole of the psalm. Catherine, would you mind presenting Bays of Hearse? Because I'm always fearful I forget the tune. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. So let's uh, let's stand to sing Psalm 23, and from verse one, the Lord's my shepherd; I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me the quiet waters by. My shepherd. I Yeah. 
shall be. Let us pray. Our Father, we we are in fear because we realize how weak we are. And yet, Lord, we rejoice when we consider the strength of our Savior, the righteousness of our Redeemer, the power of the one that protects us from the attacks of the enemy. We give thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.